Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. Hope you're doing very well today, and I hope you're ready to get back into Song of Solomon. We're here in chapter 3. I've got a good cup of coffee here. And we have the Word of God in front of us, which is even better, far, far, far better, of course, than a cup of coffee. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your faithfulness in our lives day by day. Thank you for this word from you in Song of Solomon chapter 3. Father, please write it on our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Song of Solomon chapter 3. On my bed by night, I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. I will rise now and go about the city, in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. The watchmen found me as they went about the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her who conceived me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. What is that coming? Up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of a merchant. Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are sixty mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and expert in war, each with his sword at his thigh against terrors by night. King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple. Its interior was inlaid with love by the daughters of Jerusalem, Go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. That is Song of Solomon, chapter 3. It begins here with what appears to be a dream sequence. Because it says, On, the, on my bed by night, I sought him whom my soul loves. And so, um, way in chapter 5, verse 2, it says, she says, I slept, but my heart was awake. So it's possible that this whole thing is a dream sequence, um, all the way from chapter 3 to chapter 6. That's one way to look at this. It certainly has a dream-like quality in that it kind of, suddenly moves from from scene to scene um it and so it also helps us to understand um some of the language that comes a little bit later in, in this chapter about about taking him into uh her mother's chamber um in what appears to be you know drawing him in for private sexual intimacy but then the statement of do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires and so it may be that what's happening here is that she's not literally going out into the streets and finding him and then taking him into her mother's chamber, but she's dreaming about him. She's dreaming about doing all of this. And that does seem to be a little bit better way to understand this. There are parts of Song of Solomon that are just, it's a song, it's poetic, it's, it's imagery that moves quickly from one thing to another, and it's hard to logically order it. Like yesterday we were in First Thessalonians, right? And before we were in Isaiah or, or even, even, um, you know, something like Proverbs, right? There's sort of a logic, an order, uh, a sort of linear. But that's not how Song of Solomon works. It's it's this, it's this fantastically romantic and sort of almost mystical dream of song. Um, so this, this is I think I think my interpretation that I prefer is that chapter three, four, five, and the beginning of six are all this sort of dream sequence. So she's, she's dreaming, I think. And so she, she wants to find her lover. She wants to find the one she loves. She's seeking him out. She's seeking him, but she cannot find him. 
And so she, she goes to the watchman and she says, have you seen him? Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Now, they might not even know who she is or who she loves. So that's, again, adds to sort of the dreamlike nature of this. And then finally, she gets right past them and she finds the one whom her soul loves. And she holds him. She will not let him go. She brings him into her mother's house, into the chamber of her who conceived. It's, it's a place for, of privacy. It's a place of, of intimacy. But then immediately the statement, again, this refrain, this is the second time it shows up. We looked at it last time. Uh, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. What does this show us? This shows us that there should be real desire and longing, even dreaming of being with your spouse. This is, this is the bride dreaming of being with her husband. Husbands should dream of being with their brides. But it's also, of course, we as believers should long to be with Christ. Him whom my soul loves for us should be Jesus. I sought him whom my soul loves. I will seek him whom my soul loves. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? I found him whom my soul loves. Look at that refrain again and again. That should be Jesus for us. I will seek Jesus. I have sought Jesus. Have you seen Jesus? I have found Jesus. And what does that mean? Not just simple faith, not just simple like, I heard the gospel, I understood the gospel, I responded to the gospel, now I have salvation. But rather it's saying, Jesus is my salvation. He is my life. He is my joy. He's my strength. He's my peace. He is him whom my soul loves. And I want to be with him. I want to spend time with him. I want to worship him. I want to sing praises to him. I want to pour out my heart before him in prayer. I want to hear from his word. I want to be with him. I held him and would not let him go. We should do that with our, with our soul in prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm clinging to you and I will not let you go. Remember, uh, Jacob, when he wrestled with Jesus all night, he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So that's what that longing should be for us. But it also should be within our marriage as well. Our soul should love our spouse. Our soul should pursue our spouse. Our soul should want to be in intimate uh, communion and fellowship and relation with our spouse. And then we see this vision of this um, litter of Solomon. It seems to be that they're getting ready for a wedding. She's getting ready to get married. She's, she's having to wait until, until she's married to have what she's so longing for. And that Solomon and his, and his entourage are coming to the wedding. So could it be an actual event? Could it be the woman's own imagination? Could it be that Solomon really did come to her wedding? Or could it be that she was just dreaming about Solomon coming to her wedding? We don't know for sure. Again, a lot of this is very dreamlike, even if it's not a dream. So here comes Solomon with 60 mighty men and this great, um, this great carriage that he has surrounded by these men of war, right? It's the king, the great king. And he has a crown that he's wearing that his mother crowned him with on, on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart, which Psalm 45 is actually a wedding psalm that we believe was written for Solomon's wedding day. And it celebrates the king and his bride. And then it becomes a picture of Christ and the church. And so this is King Solomon and his wedding day. Right? That's, that's the royal house saying, here is marriage is good. Now, we know Solomon later had other marriages and other wives, but just set that aside for a minute. Just say, the king, in all of his glory, in all of his pomp, in all of his power, in all of his might, values marriage. He, he, he remembers and values the day of his own wedding, and he comes now to bless and to attend this wedding. The king of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, values marriage even more. He's the one who created marriage. He decided to bless marriage with performing his first miracle by turning water into wine at the wedding at Cana in Galilee. And he blesses especially Christian marriages, which are a reflection of his relationship to his church. And he is looking forward to his wedding day when he will be crowned anew 
as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We will receive victor's crowns, we will lay them down at his feet, and he will be openly crowned for all to see on his wedding day when we go to the wedding supper of the Lamb. All of this imagery and all of this um, beauty and, and, and um, compelling hope should be stirred up in our hearts when we read these verses. I hope you know that Jesus is the one worth pursuing, worth chasing down, worth finding, worth clinging to. I hope that he is the one whom your soul loves. And I hope that you are longing for that wedding day, even as you need his blessing upon your marriage here on earth, if you're married, or perhaps you're yet to get married in the future, or perhaps you have been married and you've lost your spouse and you miss your spouse, but you're now looking forward to the wedding day when all people of God will be brought in in great joy. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much. We are we're just ordinary human beings who have all sorts of failures and flaws and faults. We're sinful and selfish and foolish, but you love us. You gave your son to pursue us and to bring us to you. Lord Jesus, you are the one whom our soul loves. You are the one we were created to know and to be known by. Help us to pursue you in intimacy and in fellowship, in love and desire, in hope, in holiness. For you are worthy of the pursuit and you will be found by us when we seek you, because you love us. Thank you. Amen. Amen. We're going to move on to chapter 4 tomorrow. I hope you can join me for that. And as always, I really do hope you have a blessed day in the Lord.